Welcome to the Leaving Eden Podcast. I am Gabrielle Hakoen, and I'm here with my co-host. Hi, I'm Sadie Carpenter. And we're here to talk about Sadie's life in the independent fundamental Baptist cult. Now, as you know, Sadie, um, I just saw uh, a couple days ago, Facebook showed me some old pictures that reminded me that it's been five years since I uh, had my commencement and graduation from college. And, you know, I was thinking that I miss it kind of. And college was tough, but it was fun, you know, learning, making friends, playing music, parties, and being turned into a radical socialist by my liberal arts university, as they do. Um, but higher education, I was thinking about this, higher education is supposed to be a setting for the best and the greatest ideas in the world to be taught and then explored and then challenged and then improved upon. Of course, not all colleges are created equal, and I would be willing to bet that your experience at college was quite different from mine. Well, out of the things that you just mentioned that you were doing in college, I was also playing music. So we had that in common. (laughs) Yeah, so we had one thing in common as far as anything... (laughs) As far as anything else you were doing, um, I think we should just uh, make it easy and just assume I was doing the opposite of anything else that you did in college. Yeah. So when I was uh, graduating high school, I got a a pretty okay ACT score. And because of that, I was recruited for some pretty decent colleges. Where were you getting letters from? Um, The ones that the ones that appealed to me enough to to kind of think about or even entertain the idea of going to. I I got some info from Mizzou and Missouri State. Good schools. Where else? Uh, University of Chicago. I didn't get anything from University of Chicago, I don't think. See, I was a... I was English and reading focused. My my English and reading scores were really, really good. My math and science were like barely above average. But my um, my English and reading scores were the best out of the four scores. So a lot of journalism or writing centric schools like uh, U Chicago and Yale both Yale. sent me quite a bit of information. I definitely didn't get any recruiting documents from Yale. So good for you. You must have been a pretty a pretty smart high schooler. I, I had it pretty well together, especially especially English. I was I was really really up on grammar and all that kind of stuff. Good for you. Well, good for me. Until in my infinite eighteen year old wisdom, I decided the best thing to do would be to go to Hiles Anderson College instead, which is an unaccredited Bible college. So, a degree from Hiles Anderson means a lot within the IFB movement. It's uh, prestigious, I guess you could say within IFB churches or people who are affiliated. But in the outside world, uh, a degree, say, in education, from if you get a degree in education from Hiles Anderson College, there are like two or three states that will let you teach in public schools with that. Most states won't let you teach because it's not an accredited teaching degree. Well, knowing what I know about Hiles Anderson College, the fact that two states will let you teach in public schools if you have a, <laughs> a degree from there is absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I, I wish I had looked up which states it was, but I would I would guess that Mississippi is probably one of them. So why did you decide to go to Hiles Anderson? So there was a lot of pressure going up to go to Hiles Anderson. The main idea is that state schools, um, well, like you said, will turn you into a radical liberal socialist. Yeah, like they did to me. Oh, yes, like they did to you. State schools were, or any any non-Christian university was portrayed as a place that is really immoral. They'll teach you about evolution and make you lose your faith in creation. They'll make you into an atheist. Just all, all of these bad things. And I was really scandalized, you know. Oh my goodness, everybody's going to be drinking. Everybody's going to be going to college parties. I can't put myself in that kind of, you know, worldly environment. Sadie, did you just crack a beer on the podcast right after talking about how scandalized you were at drinking? No, it's a grapefruit <laughs> rattler. <laughs> um, hmm. Moving on. As I understand it, you are in possession of a very, very dangerous item. And this item is something that the God-fearing administration at Hiles Anderson College would not want you to have. 
because this is not an item that's meant for worldly eyes because you know if you keep it somebody else might get to take a look at it <laughs> so yes i i do have something like that in my hands i'll, what I'll is tell it? you how well, let me tell you how i got it <laughs> when i was leaving campus on my last day at hiles anderson college in may of 2013 there was much to do and announcements made that everyone was required to turn in their rule books or student handbooks before leaving campus. So they even went so far as to say that you are not able to leave campus unless you can show a slip of paper that verifies that you turned in your handbook to the proper authority. So you have a student handbook from Hiles Anderson College. I sure do. It is the 2012-2013 edition. So this is something that they clearly did not want getting out. Uh, how did you manage to get this document away? So by the time I was in my last few weeks and months at Hiles Anderson, I was already so over it. Uh, and I had some roommates and friends who had left Hiles Anderson partway through the school year. Because I had roommates and friends who had left, I happened to have two copies of said rulebook. So being the, <laughs> it was the very start of my rebellious phase. And I packed uh, one of those copies deep in my suitcase. And then I went to the correct office, turned the other one in with a big fake Hiles Anderson smile and uh, made it off campus with my secret rulebook copy. Absolutely scandalous. And I know that if anybody, if anybody from Hiles Anderson is listening to this right now, I'm sure they have like alarm bells going off. They're like <laughs> hitting the button, like the Mayday alert. They've got like, you know, red flashing lights going on, sirens. Um, I'm sure they are. And I'm sure they're pretty mad. But I'm, I'm really, really glad that I found a way to keep this. Uh, again, this was one of the, about the third rebellious thing I ever did was finding a way to keep this rule book. And I, I'm so glad that I did because some of these rules are so obscure that there's no way I would have remembered them without the book in my hand. If I can give you an example, there is a rule in a college rule book which states no college ladies are allowed to loiter in the John R. Rice men's dormitory foyer area. This is the area west of the Lloyds Rice Ladies Dormitory. They may walk through this hallway to exit through the west doors when open for public use. However, they may not pause at all to use the telephones or vending machines or to talk. They may be in this area only if they are in the process of entering or exiting the building. So I've got to ask, uh, what sort of snacks are in the vending machines in the foyer if that are just so unsuitable <laughs> for ladies. Like, are Mounds bars too sexually suggestive? Oh. Maybe the name Milk Duds is too provocative. <laughs> Maybe Mike and Ike's promote the radical gay agenda, you know? They're two men, and they have a rainbow sugar snack candy together, and that seems awfully suspicious. Oh, you know, you're right. That, that was suspicious. I was just going to say that Snickers bars uh, teach you to laugh at the word of God. <laughs> No, uh, I I don't recall whether there were actually vending machines there or not. By the time I was a student, um, I do know that there was a, a bank of payphones in that hallway. I don't recall whether there were vending machines or not because uh, I was a good kid and I never stopped in that hallway. <laughs> you never loaded. You never broke that rule. Not that I can remember. Uh, for the first... Just to give you context as we're talking about some of these rules, the first three semesters that I was at, I was there for four semesters total. The first three semesters that I was there, I was very much a good kid. I was following the rules in the rulebook as closely as I could, except for my secret earbuds. <laughs> Having like briefly perused this rule book, I can tell you that that is no small task. It's a full-time job. <laughs> what are we going to do with this rule book today? So what I actually thought would be fun is how about I give you some multiple choice questions on some of the more obscure Hiles Anderson rules and see oh. how well you do. Are we going to do a quiz? Because, okay, so is this going to be like two truths and a lie? Yeah, kind of like that. I was raised on NPR. So if this is anything like, wait, wait, don't tell me, I am ready. Like, I am ready <laughs> to go. Okay, well, let me prepare you. Okay. Some of these rules are ridiculously specific. So there's this one hallway that ladies can't can walk through, but can't st uh, stop or talk in. 
<laughs> and another rule states that cell phones have to be on vibrate in all public places at all times. The ring function is not allowed in hallways, lobbies, or other public spaces. You can only have it on ring in your dorm room. For that rule, I'm on board with Hiles Anderson College. I th- yeah, I think well, that... Well, you know, I am too. I haven't used the ringer on my cell phone since the last time I was uh, applying for jobs. No, I, I agree with that rule. I just think it is quite ridiculous to have a rule in a college rule book about it. I mean, but what are we, animals? Okay, I got one more example for you. So my first year at Hiles Anderson brought a really big rule change. It was something that people had been waiting for for years. Oh, my first year, possibly my second year, I don't want to say 100% for sure. Hosiery was required only in classes, chapel and church services. What was the change to the rule that, that made this a big deal? The, the big deal was that in previous years before, and again, I'm not sure if it was 2011 or 2012, but in previous years to that, hosiery was required anytime you were outside your dorm room. That means if it's 95 degrees outside, that means if you're in Chicago, that means if you're doing, if you're doing sports all the time. Like, if, what if you're like walking to the bathroom? Uh, that's, in, that's on your dorm floor. So you're oh, okay, fine. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, so hit me with some of these questions here. Let's see how I do. Okay. So first, uh, if you're going to try to act like a Hiles Anderson boy today... Okay, I'm going to try to... Uh, I, I hope not, but okay. We'll, you're we'll going to be a it. hacker for a day. A hacker. So so the, the school mascot is Highlanders, as in Scottish Highlanders. Um, oh, because it's Highland... Okay, I Hiles get it. Highlanders Anderson it's, Highlander, yeah. But the the slang term for students is hackers, H-A-C-ers, hackers. So I'm going to ask you, what would you wear to class at Hiles Anderson? So you're, you're a dude, you want to go to Hiles Anderson. What are you going to wear today? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a good Christian man. I'm going to <laughs> to this unaccredited Bible college with obscenely strict rules. So I'm going to guess that it's it's very formal because when I was when I was in college, you know, if I had like an 8 a.m. class, I would literally roll out of bed, put on a hoodie, and grab my computer and like go, and like that's it. Yeah, that would not fly at Hiles Anderson. I'm gonna guess that it's got to be a shirt with buttons on it, um, mm-hmm. and a collar. Mm-hmm. What materials? What, what materials? Um, I don't know. Cotton. Cotton or poly cotton. Poly cotton. Okay, cotton Silk or poly is specifically cotton. not allowed. Silk is not allowed. Wow, they're they're not trying to let us dress sexy at all. So no. And then I assume that you have to wear, you know, your shirt tucked into dress pants. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. A okay. shirt must also be buttoned all the way up at all times. All the way up at all times. Do you have to wear a tie? Yes. You have to wear a tie. Okay. And you have to wear a jacket, I'm assuming. You have to wear just like full suit. Full suit for church services, all classes, college chapel, and dinner, but not lunch. But not lunch. At, at lunch, you can you still have to wear your tie, but you can take off your jacket. And uh, if, if you do want to get sexy, you can roll up your sleeves. <sighs> Ooh, yeah. Show off those <laughs> forearms. <laughs> yes. Listen, I've been out of the IFB for like seven years now, and I'm still like, you know, hey, husband, why don't you roll those shirt sleeves up? Uh, how about how about shoes then? I assume that they have to be dress shoes and they have to be polished. That is correct. They also may not have a combat tread. A combat tread. Okay. They may not have markings that resemble an athletic shoe. So no Nike swooshes. Right. No swooshes, no markings like that. So if I went to class in like an, a full Adidas tracksuit, I would get immediately expelled. You'd get taken to the to the um, president's office, probably. Also, no boat shoes, no moccasin style shoes. Is suit color specified? It is not specified in my copy of the rule book that I am looking at. That doesn't mean that that some are allowed. You know, it doesn't mean that you can wear any color. It just means that it's an unwritten rule, not a written rule. I am a man who, from time to time, enjoys, owns and enjoys wearing a white suit. So there's no rule in the rule book that prevents it. And I think that's actually a, a great excuse to talk about kind of the unwritten rules. So there is no rule that says you can't wear a white suit. I, I do know some people who did at Hiles Anderson. So you'd be allowed, so, you know, if you, when you went to dress check before chapel, 
where they put everyone in humiliating little lines and go over your appearance with a fine tooth comb and tell you what you did wrong, uh, which is a whole nother can of beans. So it's like in the military. It's exactly like that, except for girls have to kneel on the floor to make sure their skirts are long enough, which is another issue I have with dress check. Sounds inappropriate. It's it's not fun, I'll tell you that. So you'd go to dress check and you'd probably pass dress check uh, after, a, you know, you've shaved and you've cut 90% of your hair off. Oh, okay. Well. I'm sorry, it's the rules. Um, but when you wore that white suit around campus... You might get picked on. You might get bullied. If somebody got it in their idea that that was too gay of you to dress that fancy, um, you could potentially get beat up by guys in the dorms. If you were out of favor with the administration, if you had made somebody mad in the faculty and staff. Which no doubt I would have, knowing me. I am quite sure that you would make someone mad within five minutes of hitting campus. <laughs> but if you had if you had managed to piss somebody off, they might give you demerits for the suit anyway. They might find something about it that technically breaks some technical rule and write you up for that. Worst case scenario, somebody might preach a sermon in chapel and talk about uh, you know, bad mouth all those all those guys walking around here in white suits. So the whole student body, it's a public shaming because the whole student body knows who you are and that you're the only guy who has a white suit. And then none of the girls want to date you. And then you your social opportunities are really limited. Wait, none of the girls would want to date me because I'm too much of a bad boy? Oh. That seems like counterintuitive. If you're dating a bad boy, that significantly reduces your chances of other markers of social status. Like being in a being in a tour group, in a college singing group, getting to perform in chapel, getting chosen for certain ministry opportunities. Yeah, if you're associating with a bad boy, that's going to hurt all of your other social and advancement opportunities. So you wouldn't want to do that. The heart wants what it wants. And speaking of that, let's move on to the second question. Yeah, I have a question. I had to, of course, have a question from the dating category for you. Dating category. Okay. <laughs> yes. So what's what's like an ex- obscure rule from the dating category? Okay. So one obs- one rule to, to set the tone would be couples may canoe together on the college lake, provided that they sit on opposite ends of the canoe. The picture that I'm getting in my head right now is is from like a Cialis commercial. <laughs> I, I imagine that's exactly what it looks like. Then you get out of the canoe and then you end up in separate bathtubs. Yeah, separate bathtubs on the edge of a lake. No, I think I think that would be accurate. So at Hiles Anderson College, a, a lot of the dating rules revolve around the lake and uh, where you can and can't walk, where you can and where you can walk, but you can't stop, stand, or sit. A a lot of the rules regard basically putting couples in positions where they're never out of eyesight of someone else who is going to tell on you if you touch at all. Because you do not touch the opposite gender. No handshakes, no holding hands, no kissing, nothing. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. And not only is actually touching considered improper physical contact, but so are walking or sitting too closely, sitting on the ground together and lying on the grass together. Damn. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty strict. As far as, as far as one rule, a date is defined as, quote, a fellowship between a man and a lady for social purposes, whether planned or accidental, that lasts for more than blank minutes. How many minutes? 5, 10, 20, or 60? I'm going to say that they're as strict as possible and say it's 5. It's actually 10 minutes. Oh, wow. They're more lenient on that one. Yeah. They're, I mean, have- yeah. So you can, you can talk to someone for 9 minutes and 30 seconds before you're dating. You have that stopwatch app open on your phone at all times. So by the time I got there, that rule wasn't really strictly enforced. But about two or three years before I started at Hiles Anderson, it was absolutely enforced with stopwatches, literal stopwatches. So like if you were the type of person who would just go snitch on people, I don't know, my social standing could could get improved, I guess. Yes. That, that's actually like a thing. Yeah, it really is. Um, 
It's not, it, I wouldn't say it's verbally encouraged. Too often, you occasionally might hear something in, in class or chapel to the effect of, you know, if you see somebody else breaking a rule, it's part of the honor code to to tell on them. It's not hyped up a whole lot, but somebody who tells on other on other students is seen to be a, a person with integrity. So the idea is basically if you had any integrity, you wouldn't let other people break the rules. The type of person that like goes around snitching on people for breaking the Oh, that's the worst. Like snitching on people because it makes you look good and because it might improve, uh, oh. you know, your choice of roommates next semester. Or it might improve you getting your to be the captain of your own bus route. Or it might make you more likely to get a scholarship next year. You know what I'm reminded of right now? Yeah, in like Harry Potter, Draco Malfoy, when he got to become a prefect. <laughs> yeah, Harry Potter, yeah. That, that fantastic book series with no author. She exists. She's just transphobic. <laughs> No, but it, it is exactly like that. That makes me so angry. That makes me irrationally angry. Well, it's all about, you know, you said you were learning all about power structures in college. And I guess I guess I was, too, because you have the administration and then they put certain students in charge of other students. And it's those students who are in charge of you. A big part of their responsibility is to snitch if you do anything you're not supposed to do. I was learning about power structures by reading books about like slavery, civil rights and things of that nature. But I was learning about power structures by being on like the second to the bottom tier of one of them. Oh, wow. Second to the bottom. Well, then I then I messed up and then I was below the bottom tier for the rest of that semester. I'm, I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm waiting to tell that one until I can really do it justice. So what's question number three? Give me a hard one. I got I got a hard one for you. So I am a female student at Hiles Anderson, and I would like to go off campus and have a cup of coffee at the coffee shop down the road with my friend who has a car and do my math homework at a coffee shop down the road. Okay. So the rule book literally states that passes for young ladies to go off campus must be signed by the Dean of Women's Staff and posted on the dorm door of each young lady. However, there are several unwritten procedures that I also need to follow to get off campus with my friend for that cup of coffee. How many ladies, and remember, no men would be allowed in the car under any circumstances, how many ladies would be required to get off campus for that cup of coffee? How many? Yeah. Do you want to see your multiple choice questions? Yeah. what's, What's my multiple choice questions? Okay. A, one, as long as she is at least 18. B, one, as long as she is at least 21. C, two girls, as long as one of them is at least 21. D, two girls, as long as one of them is an approved girl or none of the above. What's an approved girl? So an approved girl is a junior or senior student who has never gotten into any significant trouble. Oh, okay. So like we were talking about with the social standings, with the rule breaking. So that mm-hmm. w- that wouldn't have been you. I, well, I didn't get to my junior year, but it still would not have been me. <laughs> I'm going to guess, yeah, the, the strictest one. Two, as long as one is an approved girl? Yes. That is correct. Yes! Good job. There are some other unwritten rules, however. <laughs> we okay. have to, we will have to be back before dark. And here's the really fun one. So me and my friend went to this coffee shop. I'm doing my math homework, drinking a raspberry mocha because that's the best. And I see at a table across from me, three or four guys from the college who are also doing their math homework, drinking coffee. Okay. I am not allowed, if I need help on a math question, I am not allowed to go talk to them. I'm not even supposed to like wave at them across the room. So you don't even acknowledge them? Not supposed to acknowledge them in any way. Because okay. that would count as, if I acknowledge them, that would count as an off-campus date. And then I can be punished for having an off-campus date without a chaperone. And that's a, and that's a big no-no. That's a, that one is, you might get expelled if you're already in any kind of hot water. But yeah, so the, the written rules are are pretty intense, but then you add on all the unwritten rules and it gets very difficult to keep everything straight. 
about that this this is specifically a rule for uh for female students is that i'm i'm reading from the wikipedia page here and it says that there is separate requirements for male and female students for the same degree for example the bachelor of science degree uh program has a quote unquote curriculum for ladies that requires classes including home decorating clothing design and understanding your husband now i i have to ask did you ever have to take understanding your husband i did not i did take christian womanhood and preparation for marriage and one other like ladies and marriage specific class that i can't remember the name of do they have classes for men being like okay this is to prepare you for marriage or is it just for ladies not that i know of so like having a good marriage that's a responsibility that falls entirely on the wife well yeah your husband is too busy in ministry so you've, you've got to keep in mind all of these young girls, young women are expecting to meet a preacher boy and marry him. You're going to be a pastor's wife, an assistant pastor's wife, a missionary's wife, uh, or something, youth pastor's wife, maybe. And if you get all the way through college and you're so unlucky that you can't find a guy who's willing to marry you, then, well, I guess you can be a church secretary or a Christian school teacher. And then maybe you'll meet somebody. Right. But the idea is that, you know, you're most likely in college to be somebody's wife. And that somebody is going to be on a mission from God and so busy. He's going to work 60 to 80 hour weeks, the most of your marriage. So it's going to be your responsibility to keep house, to make all his meals, to do all his laundry and to be a perfect wife because your husband is so stressed and so busy with the amount of work that a ministry puts on him that you're going to have to pick up all the slack everywhere. What would they be teaching you in a uh, preparation for marriage class? So preparation for marriage class was a lot more about uh, like what to emotionally expect out of your husband. Uh, kind of what I was just telling you about, um, you know, he's going to be this great man of God and how to manage your own expectations, how to get everything done behind the scenes to set him up for success. Uh, I have a quote from my actual prep for marriage notes. So here's, here's a good one. Your greatest offensive weapon is your mouth. Don't ever say anything critical of your husband, especially in front of your children. Find a husband that you can respect enough to do this for him. Yeah, and that extends much more than, you know, much more than you think. I think it the the literal sound of that is more like don't, you know, if your husband cooks you dinner and you didn't think it was 100% great, just maybe smile and nod. Flatter his ego in every possible situation and never say anything that could be at all critical. At all. So if you're driving down the car, driving down the road in the car with your husband and he's got the air conditioner up too high, you don't say it, it's too cold. You get a sweater. That's, your that's... physical comfort and your physical safety are less important than your husband's ego. Your needs are so are, are not even secondary. They're not even... Right. So that's kind of what was in prep for marriage. Um, and then I have a little bit from Christian womanhood class, which everybody takes no matter what freshman year. What sort of expectations are there for women? Well, here's some uh, here's some notes from a Christian womanhood class. This, these were actually taken by a, fr a friend of mine who posted them online. Do not wear a ponytail or hair in a claw two days in a row. Wear a hairstyle that flatters your face. Do not wear your hair too short. Wear a soft hairstyle. Consider your husband or father's taste in your hairstyle. Or father's? Yeah, well, you're, you're property of your dad until you're married, and then you're property of your husband. Hmm. So uh, there's more on hair, but I'll skip to makeup. Uh, use modest makeup, use concealer, accent your eyes, use mascara and eyeliner modestly. Be careful about eyeshadow. Use blush, use foundation, use powder, li use lipstick, pl pluck eyebrows, and it, it goes on and on. That's what's taught in a college class about Christian womanhood. Wow. But then on, under clothing, it says, learn men's taste. Accent your waist. Wear extended shoulders. Don't wear oversized clothes. Extended shoulders? What is it? 1987? Well, yes, I think it still is. Yes. <laughs> Don't wear the following too often. Jean skirts, culottes, tennis shoes, and sweatshirts. 
flatter your coloring, flatter your figure. Then it, it goes on to teach, you know, how to tell if you're a winter, summer, autumn or spring or all these kind of very outdated uh, women's fashion advice. You know, that's from Christian womanhood. That's the, the right. course that every, every freshman girl. And you would have had to do homework in this class. I don't recall there being a lot of homework other than memorizing scripture and maybe a book we had to read. I can't remember. Uh, but we had to take tests in that class and you had to pass it to, you know, to move on to your sophomore year. Wow. Well, you know what? Okay. So this is what this reminds me of um, and what men's rights activists desire for the women that are in their lives. Um, what I did and please pray for me after me having done this was I, um, I trolled the depths of a very popular and well-known men's rights activist forum, which was not pleasant. I'm sorry. And I'm not going to provide a link to that because I don't want other people looking at it. If you're not familiar with it. Um, thank, thank you for taking one for the team. We appreciate that. So this is this is what I found, and I, I I spent like a few hours doing this, and like sifting through comments, and just like reading and reading and reading the stuff that these guys would say. Sort of ten things that I pulled out of it that are like MRA requirements for women, and maybe if some of them are different for different people, and different people have different preferences or whatever. But these are like 10 things that I saw repeated. So, like most common. Yeah, mo like very common. So number one was body mass index was... Ew. Yeah. So the numbers that I saw repeated, and like I found a whole forum thread about this. It was a body mass index of between 16 and 23. Now, first of all, body mass index is not a particularly useful way to measure somebody's fitness or, or health or whatever regard us aside from that healthy body weight healthy bmi is considered between 18 and 24 so if you're mm -hmm. between 18 and 24 that is considered a normal bmi so this has it between 16 and 23 and 16 17 that's technically classified as underweight uh, like unhealthfully underweight then like 23 is acceptable, but 24 isn't acceptable because, and I quote, I, I kid you not, several guys talking about this on this forum where they were like, if it's 24, then she's too close to 25. That's too close to the edge of being overweight. And that's not acceptable. Huh. So, so that was one thing that I saw. Number two was that always wears makeup. Like you said, like looks good for me. Number three mm -hmm. was good around the house, cooking, cleaning. Number four, no children from other men. Number five, like sex, but not a sl And this was something that I saw talked about quite a bit, where it was like maximum three previous sexual partners is, accept is acceptable um, and virgins are preferred. <laughs> Just very uninformed. Yeah, un uninformed and like you have no idea what you're talking about. Num number six is respectful of me. Number seven, does not question my judgment. Number eight. See, this one was interesting because it always seemed like it was thrown on as like an afterthought to so that they wouldn't feel as like sexist. And it would be sometimes like has go has goals and aspirations. And this was sometimes like included in things that these guys want for women, but it was always left generic. Like they would never like say specifically like, I want her to be driven in her career or i want her to have artistic passion about something like that <laughs> like it was always just like has goals and aspirations but i've got something to say about that but i'll let you finish your list <laughs> number nine doesn't spend too much of my money and number 10 is always supportive of me so that is eerily similar to what i was taught in Christian womanhood seminars at First Baptist Church of Hammond and what I was taught in classes like Christian womanhood uh, and also things that we heard heard in chapel. Uh, not to go too deep into all the misogyny because I'm sure it'll come back up in more detail later. Yeah, we could do a whole podcast on that, but yeah. You know, there were a lot there were a lot of um jokes that you'd hear in chapel. Like it was really, really popular to joke about your wife putting on weight or how fat girls can't get dates at Hiles Anderson. 
uh, even preaching from the pulpit, you know, some of you young ladies, you're all sad because you can't get a date to any Hiles Anderson activity. <sighs> well, maybe you should just eat less. J- stuff like that. Coming from the pulpit in chapel, jokes about somebody's wife spending too much money, jokes about your wife putting on weight, jokes about all of these things. These are jokes that are straight out of like the 1950s. Yes, and yeah. it's really, really similar to what I've talked about before with the racism in the IFB. It was things that seemed normal to me, but always just felt funny. And I, I wish I could describe it better than like felt funny, you know? So like imagine imagine hearing that you were fat coming from your pastor. Like being like, no one will ever love you unless you lose weight. Like imagine hearing that coming from your pastor. Oh. Yeah, that is a thing that happens at, in Hiles Anderson Chapel. Would not surprise me at all if there was a huge number of, of young women that ended up with eating disorders because of it, you know? There are, I know for, I know, so people that are out publicly about it, I know two different girls that I went to college with that, that are willing to come out and say it on Facebook. Because not everyone wants to come out and talk about that because that's their own private business. Yeah. How many more do you think there are? It's the number has got to be astronomical. It's 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 a weird thing. It's it's um, it takes a lot of deprogramming for somebody like me to let go. You know, some of these things I've been able to just let just drop, just drop it like a hot potato, you know, just uh, whatever. I'm done with that. And some of these negative things have stuck around with me long term and still pop up from my subconscious and I have to still no shut up I'm not listening to that that's not reality um and it's it's very um from a somewhat detached point of view it's really interesting psychologically to see how my brain handles this <laughs> also these are like rules for what you have to do at the university and so for um here's here's basically I'm reading from the Wikipedia page. It says for the school year of uh 2010 to 2011, Hiles Anderson College listed policies that quote unquote maybe you wouldn't like, including prohibiting male long hair, the use of alcohol, cigarettes, dance, Hollywood movies, playing cards and having fellowship with liberals or um participating in quote unquote other questionable amusements, as well as requiring young ladies to be chaperoned as if they go off campus. That's what you talked about earlier. Now, as a bleeding heart liberal and radical socialist from Portland, Oregon, aka Satan's Tattoo Parlor. Well, yeah, you're exactly the person that they wouldn't want me associating with. Not only did did Hiles Anderson and the IFB movement as a whole I really feel like one of the goals of these strict rules is to alienate you from other people in the real world. It is to make me uncomfortable. It is the fact that I still just slightly sweat if you give me a ride to work in your car, because I still have that little voice in the back of my head of this is not allowed. And (laughs) you're giving me a ride like a mile. It's partially that. They do it. These roles do exist to prevent you from associating with the outside world. But it also it keeps people like you from corrupting my mind with liberal satanic philosophies like human rights for people who aren't straight white men. The one thing that I was thinking about was that in order to follow all of these rules, and there's a lot of rules in there, there's a lot of like, in order to actually follow all of those rules, one would have to essentially sacrifice the entirety of their own personality and focus all of their mental energy on making sure that they follow every rule to a T. And that's that so- is the point. <laughs> that's socially rewarded. Yeah, that's the whole idea. And what you're told is your goal as a Christian is to remove all parts of yourself that are selfish or or focus on yourself to kill your ego as thoroughly as you can to separate yourself from your physical needs and your physical desires uh but not just to you know separate yourself from the idea of you know I want to drink a beer or I want to kiss somebody 
But to separate yourself from your physical needs, like needing water and food and sleep, to, to pull yourself so far away from that world and so far into the spiritual world that they've created to the point that you are like a, you're like a Jesus robot. Like they're, they're trying to steal away your humanity. Like, yeah, have you ever seen the movie Limitless? No. I'll try to think of a better example. Here's a question. Did you ever read the book, The Golden Compass, when you were younger? I guess no. they wouldn't have no, had you read No, I it. didn't. Isn't that, the, isn't that the story about a girl who like goes to heaven to kill God? You know, the idea of this is that it's this sort of alternate reality where basically all people have like an animal companion. And when you're a child, the animal companion can change form into different animals. But then when you go through puberty, it, you know, it, it changes into one animal. It, okay. And it settles. And the whole, and so like there is this sort of uh, theocratic government that figures out that if they can separate the children from their animals, and the animal is basically their soul, but it lives outside of their body in this animal, and they've been able to like cut the children away from the soul, and having this soul is what lets the sin in. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I'd highly recommend you read it. It's a, it's a great book. You know, not just for like young adult readers, but for, you know, for it's, it's an excellent fantasy story. It's very well written. I think I will read it. And I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for young adult books anyway. Love John Green. Uh, loved the, um, the Hunger Games series because I didn't get to read that so much as a teenager when it was the, the thing. Um, so I'm still going back and catching up. <laughs> I read those books when I was in middle school. I thought they were really good. And then last year, um, I think HBO came out with uh, a series on it. They did a, a series for it. Um, and I thought that was really well done as well. That was enjoyable. Oh, neat. Had, a new thing to get into. Yeah, it had Lin-Manuel Miranda in it. Oh, well, that yeah. sold it for me. Yeah. Um, you know I'm like a super fan. In fact, like all of these ideas that are considered dangerous... There's a, a point to all of this. One of the reasons that we decided to do this podcast was because we wanted to promote uh, freedom of thought, freedom of mind, freedom of emotion. If you are raised believing any certain thing in particular, be it a religion, a political ideology, or a personal mantra or something, you have every right to challenge that belief. That if it's a belief that you were raised with, feel free to challenge it. That doesn't mean that necessarily that belief is wrong, because it very, very well could be something that is central to being a kind and compassionate person. However, you have the right to examine the roots of those beliefs and come to your own conclusions. If you, are in, in, if you are in an environment that purposely stifles free thought and free expression, because any belief system or any moral philosophy or any political ideology that is worth its salt will happily and transparently disclose to you all of the evidence both in favor and against it because it knows that it can stand up to the scrutiny. Yeah, the smartest people in the world change their minds when they're presented with new evidence. That was so well said. Uh, it always, you know, one, one actually a scripture verse that I really held on to a lot when I was questioning my own beliefs and trying to work through the fog of information control to get evidence to base beliefs on. One scripture that I really held on to was, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And on that note, I think that it's time for us to shift gears and change to uh, this week's homework assignment. Hey, Gavrielle here. If you enjoy the Leaving Eden podcast, head over to our Facebook group, Eden Exodus, where you can talk to other fans, ask us questions, and share memes. That's facebook.com slash Eden Exodus. You can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash Leaving Eden Podcast, and you'll get access to extended and uncensored episodes. You can also support our show by recommending it to your family and your friends. The Leaving Eden Podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. And now, back to the show. So if you listen to last week's show, you'll hear that I... That I assigned Sadie some homework. I told her that she had to go and watch the 1995 teen comedy movie Clueless, which is based loosely on the plot of Emma by Jane Austen. 
Um, and so have you watched the movie, Sadie? Yes, I I watched Clueless the other morning. Yeah, how, uh, what did you think of it? My my first observation was now I understand why I see all the memes about that outfit computer. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do want to know: Did people dress like that with like the knee socks and the blazers? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I was born in 1993, and this movie came out in 1995. And I think maybe in like Beverly Hills in 1995, people dressed like this, but I don't know if they ever, I don't think in Portland, they ever dressed like that. I think in Portland, everybody dressed like, um, what's his name? Travis Birkenstock. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, most likely. I was also wondering about the transit transatlantic accent. Like, did you notice that it's like super prominent? Well, I think that it's sort of like a thing that, if you're trying to act classy, the transatlantic accent was accent that was invented basically for TV and movies. And so it, that's why people in old movies like, but it was seen as like a sign of wealth and a sign of class. Right. The whole idea was to, to kind of make it seem like they could be from Europe or they could be from New York, right? Yeah. And so I think that it's because they're in like a, a, a very high class neighborhood they're in beverly hills in california yeah it it just really stuck out to me and i'm not sure why it may have just been because of the like there's a lot of slang and a lot of kind of catchphrases in the movie but that was that was just it stuck out to me so hard i couldn't look overlook it catchphrases are so aggressively 90s aren't they yeah like you you don't like you sometimes hear catchphrases now not to like the 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 point where the whole the catchphrase was the gag Like you would see in the 90s. That was huge in like 90s TV and 90s movies and stuff, especially in this one. So basically, the plot of the movie, if you haven't seen this movie, um, the main character, her name is Cher. She's like 15, 16. She's in high school. And she likes to set her friends up with other people. She sees herself as a bit of a matchmaker. So she tries to, she successfully sets up two of her teachers together and then they end up very happy and she felt really good about that. So she decided that she was going to try and do more. And she ha- there's a new kid who comes to, to her school, maybe a little less affluent than she was. So she and her friend kind of adopt her and try to get her to go out with this other guy. But this other guy's not really into her. and hilarity ensues and this other girl this poor girl maybe she wants to go for this stoner skater kid and who's like really sweet to her the whole time but that's not seen as appropriate like he's not seen as being up to her level Uh, and that's sort of the plot of the movie is that she has to learn to look past a lot of things and see what she really wants yeah and she also has to learn um more nuance in how she meddles with other people's lives that just because you think you're doing the right thing doesn't mean you are and maybe sometimes you should take a step back yeah how aggressively 1995 it is like the all of like the the music they had like they went to a party and there was like a ska band but there was like a ska punk band playing like you can see in the mid 90s which is really funny because last time I was in a band in Portland, our our last show that I was involved in was with a ska punk band oh. called Fake News. Portland, Oregon. They're awesome. Look them up. Her stepbrother would always be listening to like Radiohead, like Radiohead, the Benz. That was like the album that would that was in every every scene that he showed up. It was Radiohead. It was either like the Benz or it was um, one of the songs from that album. Yeah. And it's just it, it was so 90s and i felt like i couldn't tell the difference between is this an idealized version of the 90s or is this more like what it was like for people who you know weren't in a cult in the 90s i don't know i i barely remember the 90s but i've seen this movie and i thought this movie was really interesting especially as like a cultural touchstone because this was this had paul rudd in it paul rudd played the main character's stepbrother I know. So I saw I saw Paul Rudd come on screen and I was like, oh, my God, is that young Paul Rudd? Yeah, he was like a, he looked like a little baby. And then he tried to go a, grow a goatee halfway through and it looked and it was terrible. terrible. But like goatees were a thing in the 90s where dudes would have goatees. And that was like, oh, I'm I'm classy. And like, I think about things. But like at the end of the movie, Paul Rudd, who's like supposed to be in college at this time, he ends up dating his stepsister, who's 16. In the movie, it's like, oh, okay, and maybe that flew in 1995, and I guess that was important for the 
the connection to the Jane Austen book. And especially because they were talking about, oh, like virginity is like, was something that they were talking about. Like, oh, it's like a major theme of the movie. Yeah. It was like a major theme of the movie where she didn't want to give it up to a guy unless he was like a guy who was up to her standards. And she would always talk about, she's like, oh, I don't date high school boys. And I'm just like, are you like, yeah, I definitely didn't know how I felt about that. I mean, we could be looking at a situation where he's like, you know, 19 and she's almost 17, which like, I mean, you can go to the movies, but maybe like don't date until, you know, later. Yeah. But it's, it's icky. There's no way to like explain it away. That's not at least a little bit icky. So I, I mean, I did. I dated a guy when I was 16 who was, I think he was 20 at the time, but it was long distance. And when we did see each other, it was Baptist dating. So it was like sitting, literally never touched that guy. Uh, and we weren't together that long. But seriously, I literally dated him really casually for like three months, never shook hands, never sat next to each other. Never had any physical contact. None at all. He might have like handed me something and brushed my hand, maybe. <sighs> but no, like, so it's it's really different. I think, you know, in my upbringing, it was not uncommon for somebody who is in the later years of college or later years of high school to go out with a college freshman or sophomore. It was just, it was not a, not an issue. Like people did that. There wasn't any, the expectation was that nothing was going to happen. The expectation is you're not going to touch until you get married and you're not going to get married until she's at least 18. Was there ever any situation when they would allow you to touch each other? Oh, there was one. I forgot to tell you about that earlier. Oh no. Tell me about it now. Okay, so there is one uh, Hiles Anderson approved situation in which you're allowed to touch your boyfriend slash girlfriend. Is this written or unwritten? This is an unwritten rule. Unwritten rule, okay. But everybody knows it, so I feel confident like claiming that this is the rule. So Hiles Anderson, as we said, is in the Chicago area. It's in northwest Indiana. So it's a pretty cold place, and winters get gnarly. On some occasions, boyfriends are allowed to walk their girlfriends to or from a college bus. Typically, this happens after Sunday night church. Uh, Boys get on the boys bus to go home and girls get on the girls bus to go home. But your boyfriend's allowed to walk you to your bus because of safety. You know, it's dark. It's after church. If you are allowed to be walked to the bus by your boyfriend and if there is an ice patch on the ground and if that ice patch is too large for you to reasonably walk around it you are allowed to take your boyfriend's arm like an old-fashioned you know take his elbow to walk across the ice patch (laughs) so uh i have definitely (laughs) i have absolutely and i kid you not i have seen lines of people lined up to walk across an ice patch very, very slowly so that they can touch their boyfriend's elbow. (laughs) So we everybody always loved it when it snowed or when we got like freezing rain or something. Because then you could like, anyway, back to the movie, back to the movie. (laughs) Sorry. I'm sorry. That was too good to not share though. That's a great, that's amazing. Yeah, so you've read the Jane Austen book, Emma. I have. It has been quite a while. When I told you, it was it was a bit of a parallel between those two. So how did you feel about that as far as like movie adaptations of of classic literature go? Well, I think there was a trend of doing revamps of classic literature in teen movies in the 90s. I think that was a thing. I think there are other movies like that. Yeah, because they did the Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio. That's true, which I Danes. loved. I really, I really, really loved that one. That movie was really cool. Like, visually, that movie was really cool. I thought so, too. And I wouldn't say that I'm a Shakespeare super fan, but there are certain works by Shakespeare that are very valuable to me, very important to me. So I, I loved the DiCaprio, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. So, but like, what what did you think about this as far as like parallels go? Was there any parallel that you liked specifically or that you didn't like? Um, there was nothing that, that really 
particularly stuck out to me. I thought that it was interesting how there was the one character in Clueless, his name was Christian, and he was gay. And they made him look exactly like Rick Astley from the Never Gonna Give You Up music video. I loved Christian. I thought he was so sweet. And um, I kind of picked up on him being gay before the exposition of the film caught up to that fact. And he was really into like looking like he was from the 50s or something being like, yeah, there was like there was like something that he said or that was said about him that tipped me off like, oh, or that he was like going up and talking to the guy at the bar. Well, I don't remember exactly what it was that like clued me in, but I was like, oh, this guy, I don't think this guy's straight. And then I got really worried. I was like, oh my goodness, this movie's not going to be very progressive. They're going to be kind of homophobic here. And they totally weren't. It was just totally like, oh, no, like I'm not into you because I'm gay, but I want to be your friend. And then they're friends. And I was so happy. <laughs> So the character who they had him based on, instead of being gay, they had him already be engaged to somebody, but secretly? Yes. Like in in the book, uh, the guy was engaged. He's afraid that his aunt will not let him get married because she wants wants him to marry into wealth. So I thought that was an interesting parallel because they're like, okay, well, this guy's... um, This guy's... uh, uh, His whole... He's not available to her, but for a reason that's like socially a bit taboo huh and i thought that was that was an interesting parallel that really is i wouldn't have thought of it that way the the character ty in clueless she's the new kid she's the new kid who who share decides that she's going to adopt and like help her out give her a makeover and and ty confused me because like one of her early lines is uh i've never had straight friends before And I figured like, oh, well, she's gay and she's never had friends who, you know, she's been hanging out with queer kids this whole time and she's never had friends who aren't. No, back then that like straight meant like straight edge, like they didn't do drugs and they never like party or or drank or or anything. Yeah. And I, I didn't put that together. So then she ended up getting with boys and I was really confused. But overall, I thought the movie did a great job of representing um, Christian. So I'm not going to be mad about it. Yeah, I liked Christian. Christian was really funny. What I also thought was really funny was that at the end of the movie, they had um, Travis Birkenstock, who was the stoner kid. But they were like, oh, we're going to make him full on go into the 12 step program. That was such a twist. Like, he doesn't need 12 steps. He just needs to smoke a little bit less weed, you know? Right. No, I thought that was hilarious. Like, oh, he's in a 12 step program for weed. But it was the 90s. Say no to drugs was still like, you know, a, a prevalent idea where they're like, oh, doing drugs is amoral. And they, and they made a, a point to show they're like, oh, we only smoke weed at parties to be social. Like, whereas. <laughs> no, but it was also totally fine to, to show Cher smoking weed and then driving shortly thereafter. Yeah, but I think she made a point where she was like, oh, it wore off. Like, she, she like, specified that, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, that was, that was pretty funny to me. Uh, but I'll tell you what the most relatable part of the whole movie was for me. What was that? What was that? Okay, so it was when Dion is learning to drive. She's practicing to get her license. Yeah, she's and in her she, boyfriend's Beamer. Right, and she accidentally drives onto the freeway. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember that part. That is exactly what my first time on the freeway was like. (laughs) And that was the most relevant to my personal experience part of the entire movie. (laughs) Screaming, like yelling, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to die. And then there's semi trucks. Yeah, there's like semis beeping and and she has to just like get herself together and drive. No, that was the the most relatable part. All in all, I thought it was an enjoyable film. Definitely like a cultural touchstone. I thought it was too. And it's amazing I haven't seen it yet. It's a bit of a cult classic. Well, yeah. And my husband has introduced me to a lot of 80s and 90s super popular funny movies. You know, so I saw I saw um, Bill and Ted. I saw Wayne's World. Oh, uh, those Austin, were all, great. all the Austin Powers movies. Like all of that sort of thing I saw when I first, you know, I first got with my husband because he wanted to show me all of those. But I think girl, you know, girly movies, quote unquote, (laughs) like Clueless and Legally Blonde, like those are things I haven't seen yet. 
We'll we'll do Legally Blonde at some other time because I have a very special movie that I want you to watch for next week. Okay, another movie. Another movie. And um, in my childhood, at least, this movie came out. I think in two thousand and one. I was seven or eight years old. I, I was probably like first, second grade. This movie, in my opinion, is the most important movie of the 21st century. And this is a movie that you haven't seen yet. This movie is, of course, the fantastic movie known as Shrek, <laughs> starring Mike Myers and Eddie Murphy and Cameron Diaz. It's that good? It's that good. It's that important. It's uh, it's one of those movies that you watch it as a kid and you think, oh, that's so funny. Like, it's it's a great movie for for kids, you know, for Mm -hmm. kids who are in like elementary school, middle school. And then you watch it as an adult and it still works. I mean, I remember it being big and I remember some really popular songs being in the movie. That's all I really know, though. That's literally it. It's incredible. So that's your assignment for next week is that you're going to watch Shrek and then we're going to talk about it. Okay. I will get right on that. (laughs) On that note, I think that we're going to have to end this episode of the show. Yeah, this was fun. And I did want to say real quickly to anybody else who has experience at Hiles Anderson or to people who are curious, we are going to go a lot deeper into that institution in the future. But it's the sort of thing that I think it does better in parts. We have an email address. If you've got questions, if you've got comments, if you've got an experience, then you can get in touch with us. You can write to us. And the email address for that is leavingedenpod at gmail.com. Yeah. And I also am super happy to take specific questions like, what did the IFB think about this thing? Or what was your experience in this particular area? I, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, and um, at some point we'll do an episode where we just answer questions, where we basically just do a mailbag, or we have that be as a major part of the episode. So um, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this episode. Um, until next time, my name is Gavriel Hakoen. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at, at G A V R I E L. H-A-C-O-H-E-N. Um, you can find the podcast on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Instagram and Facebook, it's Leaving Eden Podcast. Um, and Twitter, it is at Leaving Eden Pod. And I'm Sadie Carpenter. You can find me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music uh, or on Twitter at Hell Yes yeah Sadie. Yeah. And until next time, thank you for listening. Uh, you guys have a nice day. Bye bye. Yeah.